Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished uh, ISS team members, Abdullah Itauko Muhammad's late administration of the ISS Nigeria, we are all here because of you. We are all here because we have used your brains to make sure that this program has seen the light of the day or the brightness of the night. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Abdulwumini Inda, the master of ceremony for this event. And this, this event is an introductory uh, pre-conference workshop organized by this gigantic uh, society of ours, ISS Nigeria, in collaboration, of course, and support of the University Technology Malaysia International. If you are here, you are not here by accident. You are here for a purpose. You are here to increase knowledge. And ladies and gentlemen, the personality that was invited for this workshop is indeed a giant. It's a person that is very close to my heart. It's a person which I can term as my teacher that we couldn't meet one on one, but online. So I'm happy to introduce our own uh, presenter or research person today. But before then, if you come to somebody's house, there is need for the owner of this house to say welcome. May I invite the president, ISIS Nigeria, Abdullahi Tanko Muhammad, popularly known as ATM. ATM not giving you cash in terms of money, but cash in terms of development, in terms of knowledge. Abdullahi Tanko Muhammad, the floor is yours. Can you say all of us welcome? Thank you. Abdul Mumin Inda, before that, can we yes. open with a prayer first? Okay. Yes. Excellent. Uh, who is uh, Brother Abakar Abdullah Balaado? Can you please open the session with prayers? Okay. Salu ala Nabil Karim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us everything that we do. Thank you so much. That has been a prayer from Abdullahi Bala Ado. Uh, of course, there is always need to include God in whatever we do. Uh, after that, may I invite or re-invite Abdullahi Tanko Muhammad, the President, ISS Nigeria, to give us a welcome address. Mr. President. Thank you very much, the MC Ustaz Abdul Mumini Inda. Our August visitor, who is our facilitator, our facilitator today, Professor Dr. Aminul Islam. Uh, I welcome you to this program. Students of UTM, in particular Nigerian students and non-Nigerians alike. Other non UTM students that join us today here. Um, academic staff of both UTM and other universities across the globe that join this program. Ladies and gentlemen, you are welcome to the pre conference workshop organized by International Student Society Nigeria. UTM as one of the programs line up for this year's ESES conference, ESES 2021 conference. Um, some of you may not know, the International Student Society Nigeria and UTM normally organize conference annually. The conference is called ESES, International Conference for science, engineering, and social science. So today's program 
which is a pre-conference workshop, is going to be a lecture to be delivered by no other but our August visitor and facilitator, Professor Dr. Aminul, uh, Aminul Islam. For those of you, or those of us that are conversant with Prof, Prof is a person that commands respect when it comes to issue of research methodology, because it's a mastery of research methodology. I will not talk much because Prof is here to really prove uh, what we what we all know him for. Uh, if you Google his profile on ResearchGate, you will attest to the fact that Prof is a very big personality when it comes to research and publication. We are glad that we have Prof in our mix today to take us through the regimens on scientific paper crafting and publication in high impact journals. All of us here that shows interest, that shows passion for research and publication, and that is why we're here, I want to believe that we are postgraduate students either at master's or PhD level, or even undergraduate students, because at these levels, we all know the importance of research and publication uh, in our various programs. So at this point, I want to call on all of you and implore you to sit and remain listening attentively, attentively to the lecture that will be delivered by this high personality that we invite here today. I want to enjoy you to make maximum uh, utilization of this opportunity given to learn the rudiments of scientific paper crafting and publication. So that at the end of it, at the end of the day, we will all have a cause to smile that we have gained a lot from this lecture that will be delivered. So once again, I welcome you all and wish you a very successful lecture. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you so much, our dear president, ATM Abdullahi Tanko Muhammad for this wonderful opening remark and welcome address. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, may I have the honor and privilege to read to you the citation of the personality that, that is our only source person today. He is no any other person but Professor Dr. MD Aminul Islam. Who is he? He is currently working as a professor in the finance division of the Faculty of Applied and Human Sciences at University of Malaya, Paris. He received his bachelor's degree from the International Islamic University in Malaysia, MBA, and Doctor of Philosophy from University of Sens, Malaysia, USM. He also completed an advanced diploma in teaching in higher education from the North Wickham not Nottingham Trent University. Ladies and gentlemen, our resource person is an award winner, academic, a researcher, professor. Islam received the Raffles Education Founders Award for being the most deserving academic staff of Olympia College, Malaysia 2006, Excellent Academic Support Award 2009, the Best Lecturer Award, the Best Lecturer Award in 2010, the best supervisor award in 2018. Can we mute our mic, please? The best supervisor award in 2018 and 2019 for producing the most number of PhD graduates. A research excellence award in 2020 at the University of Malaysia Paris. He also won the best PhD thesis award 2011 for the outstanding PhD dissertation at the University of Science Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen. It's not the end. He is a member of Asian Academy of Management, Malaysian Institute of Management, and an associate member of Malaysian Finance Association. He is a visiting professor of Ubadiya University, Indonesia, Northern University, Bangladesh, Dafodil International University, East Delta University, Tamasat University, Thailand, and academic advisor of Central College, Penang. Ladies and gentlemen, our resource person. 
He has authored and co-authored five books, two book chapters, and about 207 research papers. His writings have so far attracted about, guess what? About 600,000 reads in the research gate and about 5,000 citations in the Google Scholar. Ladies and gentlemen, 23 PhD students and five postdoctoral post scholars completed their study with his supervision. His recent research has found issues related to fintech, entrepreneurship, blockchain, blue economy, Islamic by banking, and scoop. If not, wow, what should I leave you with that citation? All we say, apart from wow, is Masha Allah, Tabarakallah. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and privilege to invite the giant scholar, Professor MD Aminul Islam to take charge of the presentation. Professor Sam. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Abdul. Mumini, right? Uh, the moderator, yes. yeah. the president, uh, Brother Abdullah, uh, the other academic uh, staffs uh, and students. Assalamu alaikum and very good evening. Uh, I think in Nigeria is afternoon. And yeah. uh, some places it could be morning. Joseph, you have joined me. Uh, well, uh, I, I won't talk much uh, before I start. Uh, basically, I would like to thank uh, the Nigerian uh, International Student Society Nigeria, the UTM chapter, uh, for inviting me to share some of my little learnings that I have on writing publishing papers. Uh, this is a pre-conference workshop, as I understand, right? This yes. is uh, the pre ics 2010 conference pre-conference workshop, and this is organized uh, also jointly uh, with University of Technology Malaysia international office right well um, with that let me uh, slowly start uh, writing a paper is basically an art uh, everything that you do actually everything that you do in your life uh, there is an art in it uh, be we play football we play cricket or play hockey you know whatever games we play there is an art in it in every game and uh, when we study and uh, those of our colleagues, friends, they do extremely well in their academic life. They also find the art of, you know, uh, getting things uh, easily and uh, the art of writing during the exam. Everybody reads the same material and yet the, answer, the answers are different. And the scores, of course, would be different, right? So there is an art in everything. Millions of people are writing papers worldwide. Um, but not everyone's paper are cited and read by, and cited by uh, people. And there, there are certain writings people like. Uh, there, there are certain write-ups are very robust and very good, and yet uh, the, the readers uh, somehow, you know, don't cite them. So there are ways of getting into the heart of uh, the people who used who supposed to read our paper. All right. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you some of the arts of writing, and some clues and tips for publishing paper in a uh, high impact journal. Well, um, I think before I start sharing my slide, let me make a point here also. Uh, those of you who are beginner, I don't think you'd be thinking of publishing your paper in a high impact journal. It shouldn't be. <laughs> I have read some uh, writers and some academicians in the social media uh, telling uh, authors not to uh, publish papers in a peer review journal. At least it should be Scopus Index. I'm not sure why uh, you have to start with the Scopus Index journal from the beginning of your career. If you have not written any paper at all until now, it, it may not be that easy for you to penetrate in a Scopus Index journal. It's a good peer review in Scopus Index journal. So I would say, no, you shouldn't be starting that. When you started your academic career, you started from the standard one class one, and slowly we start learning, and then uh, you complete your O-level, then A-level, and then you proceed to degree, then your master's, then PhD, right? So I cannot be asking you to directly enroll into PhD once you start your career, right? 
So I would never advise you to start publishing your first paper in the Impact Factor Journal. Of course not, uh, because you'll be frustrated looking at the rejection rates and the corrections uh, given by the reviewers and all that. I would always recommend beginners to start with conference papers. Conferences are easy to penetrate for the newcomers. And conferences are the place where actually you will get very good feedback for further improvement of your paper. So the first stage, if you have not written a paper, writing for the first time, or may have written a few, and you are coming with some uh, new ideas, then the first thing you should do, you should try to submit paper in a conference, like the conference going to start tomorrow, huh? My brother Abdullah's conference. So you should start submitting paper in different conferences. Go there, if possible, physically, if online, present it. Get some confidence of presenting papers. There is an art in presentation also and handling the questions from the participants uh, while you uh, are there, right? So that gives you the room for you to get exposure and getting feedback from people and you would have the feeling that how uh, reviewers are going to give you the kind of feedback that uh, you expect from the papers, all right? So once you get feedback from conferences, you make correction and then you would submit in a journal. Let me also add on this to uh, with this. Uh, if you're submitting a conference paper to a journal, make sure that you have made at least 40% changes in the paper that you have submitted in a conference, okay? So if you submit the same paper that you have submitted in a conference, the journal will not be accepting that, right? At least 40% changes, and you have to make acknowledgement that this paper was first presented in a conference, and you have to name the conference, and then you have to make changes. Possibly you can make, you can make some changes in the title also. Then only you can submit in the journal, okay? So let me share my... Uh, slide and uh, is that uh... okay uh, can you see my slide just one of you please uh, respond then will be good yes 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 yes, yes. yes, bro. yes. okay let me see uh, how can i hide this okay And this one is the we'll be on uh, the this is the view uh, okay this one is why is that is there the okay now it's good right you can see it. all right so um, that's the title for today's presentation uh, writing a standard research paper and publish in high impact journals um, and I do have a, a YouTube channel. Those of you are new with me now, a platform for somebody who would like to annotate. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot allow you. There will be some problems, so please don't do that. I have to decline. I'm sorry. So my uh, YouTube channel is a platform for research and development. Uh, I, I have a number of videos there uh, that is basically to help the students, all right, uh, worldwide, those who would like to do research and get some assistance in it, okay? Now, uh, this is how um, I would like to start. Huh? If you are writing a paper and submitting a journal to publish, then uh, that's how your paper is going through the stringent, stringent uh, decline, you know, uh, review policies, right? So most of the journal, they will have at least two reviewers. If it's a good journal, huh? uh, there are many predatory journals available, you should know them. Uh, if you just pay them, you submit paper today, after three days, they send you the acceptance letter or after one week, and they ask you to pay, you pay, and they will publish the paper. Those are the predatory journals. They shouldn't be publishing there. Uh, you will get into trouble if you are doing that, okay? So in a good journal, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have stringent review policies. And you can see the picture. That's how your paper will go through. And uh, then only you will see the light. Uh, you'll get it published. I have published few papers, uh, like one of my papers I published in MRL, and it took me about one and a half years. So I had to do two or three rounds of corrections uh, given by the reviewers, and uh, that only I managed to get it published. And even after getting acceptance, the paper was in the queue, and it took a long time to get it published. But if you're getting published after going through that process, you will have some kind of inner satisfaction that you look forward, okay? All right. Uh, this is, uh, I think, that the, the moderator already introduced me. Basically, I have about four or 5,000 citations in 
Google Scholar and about 600,000 600, uh, people have read our paper. I would say my paper, uh, most of my paper contributed my PhD uh, and postdoctoral students. Okay. Now, let us see where do you stand. Huh? This is uh, Ken Ford versus Go Gross John. Um, most of us, uh, we, we love to stay in the comfort zone. Huh? Save and control, and it's not only the students, even academic staff. Many I see, uh, once they complete the PhD and get a stable, they sit. You know, they, they feel very comfortable and they don't want to move around and doing some extra things. Okay, that's the comfort zone. So if you are like to cross the comfort zone, you will get in the fear zone, huh? lack of self confidence, uh, finding excuses, and you get affected by the opinions. Now, if you have this any of these three then you are in the fair zone. Now, the next level would be if you can cross the fair zone, then you'll be going into the learning zone. So here, the indications are basically will deal with challenges uh, and uh, problems. You see problems and challenges, you don't uh, turn your face from there. You start looking into, explore into it and try to find out the answers or solutions to it. You love to acquire new knowledges, new skills, and you extend your comfort zone, huh? so you are extending from. So this is a learning zone. Uh, possibly, those of you who are now uh, doing PhD or beginning to uh, pursue PhD, that's where you are now there. Huh? Most of us uh, partly are there. We acquire new skills and new knowledge. The growth zone, uh, that's where you should be and we should be. Uh, we love everything that we do. We find purposes of doing it. Uh, we live with dreams. Uh, we'd like to be somebody. We'd like to do something. And every day, every every time we do something, uh, we, we have something in mind that we'd like to achieve. Setting new goals and then we acquire objectives that is set. So this is a great growth zone. Uh, usually when you are completing PhD or about to complete a PhD or in the middle of PhD, you should be already in the growth zone. If you're not there, then um, I foresee you will have problem later, even after completing your PhD, okay? So most of us actually, we should, we should, those of you are with me, we should fall either in the learning zone or growth zone, or possibly uh, half in the learning zone and half in the growth zone, okay? Or I'm not gonna ask uh, some of you which, which uh, zone you fall in. Huh? Now, preamble, uh, basically uh, I am making an assumption that uh, we have collected, uh, we have conducted the research, collected the data, analyzed it, and now, um, it is the time to write and publish, okay? So why do we write papers, okay? Uh, basically, uh, we'd like to share ideas and expertise. Uh, we'd like to tell and uh, tell our stories that we do research. Uh, remember, every research is done uh, based on certain stories, certain research problem. And once you solve a problem, then definitely um, we have an, uh, uh, you know, a story to tell to people that you know how you get into the research problem, uh, how did you uh, identify and define the research problem, uh, what kind of research people, paper you read, what kind of research methodology, you collected data and all that, so finally what did you find? And whether your findings are solving the problem, okay, and whether you are contributing something new to the world. So that is telling and selling stories. Huh? Uh, when you write paper, basically we're enhancing our skills and definitely we need to publish papers because of our career, enhancement and finally there are many reasons i just put few here uh, giving back to the society uh, uh, the place we are in now is not because of my uh, intelligence and talent alone there are so many people from the society contributed to our career okay our our, our parents our, our friends our relatives our teachers uh, there's so many people contributed so now we like to give back to the society in the form of writing papers and conference thus contributing to the body of knowledge, okay? Uh, and of course, uh, we'd like to strengthen our reputation. Uh, now everything is uh, visible. So if I say I'm a good writer, it's not enough. Uh, when I say it, people will just go online and check uh, Google Scholar, they'll check the Scopus uh, database and they will check the research gate and there are so many uh, wave of science and those uh, people will, will find out where do I stand. Huh? So it's just saying I'm a great guy is not enough now. <laughs> people can easily find you, uh, find you out. Uh, you know, there are many uh, sources out there. So for an academic, the choice is uh, either we publish or we get published. 
uh, if you join as an academic after completing PhD, and if you're not publishing good papers in good journals, uh, then uh, your career is at stake. Uh, you may not be uh, getting promoted. You will get stuck uh, with the positions, all right? So the either we publish uh, or we get published. Huh? I have seen many of my um, senior friends and colleagues retiring as, as lecturer, you know, those having masters. And many PhD holders, I, I see them retiring as a senior lecturer, meaning that they did not get any promotion at all, but they have worked for 20, 25 years. So can you imagine? So this the kind of situation you will get stuck into huh? if you are not uh, doing uh, good research and publishing in good journals. Okay. Now, there are many uh, reasons why a paper gets rejected. Okay. So I, I put few here for you to look at. Uh, number one, out of scope, uh, when you choose a journal, make sure you read the scope of the journal. Uh, if your paper falls out of the scope of the journal, the paper will be automatically rejected. In the first screening itself, the editor will reject the paper. Lacking state of the art overview, huh? this is very, very important. When you write introduction, uh, make sure that you have very good overview of your research paper uh, that basically tells people uh, what is the problem that you are, you know, uh, uh, trying to solve and uh, what are the evidences uh, that, that basically tells the reader uh, that you are going to, going to try to solve. And the readers will feel that it is very important to do research in that area, okay? Lack of originality. Lack of originality, this is another one. If you are just copying and uh, duplicating research, then definitely uh, you won't have the originality. The novelty is not there. And uh, some of us, we do replicate papers, right? Uh, but we got to make sure that we have something new there. So originality, novelty is very important. Lack of conclusion. Uh, the newcomers will have difficulty to find out what is uh, uh, the most important uh, part of the, uh, the findings. And that should be highlighted in the conclusion. And that has to be something totally new. Uh, that has to be something, uh, uh, an added value to the existing body of knowledge. <clears throat> Flaws in the research design and methods. We, we, if you have selected wrong method in uh, research, uh, you know, collecting data analysis and uh, wrong research design and all that. Unclear research question, redundant publication and lack of relevance, okay? So these are one group. The other group uh, you can see um, would be quite similar, but again, <clears throat> in a different way of um, saying it. Lack of novelty, originality, presentation of obsolete study. So here we have included one more. When you are citing papers, make sure your cited papers fall in the latest five years. Huh? Latest five years. Uh, we can uh, we can definitely we can definitely cite the older papers if you are citing. Uh, a theory, uh, underpinning theory or supporting theories in your paper. That theory may have been proposed, uh, that theory has been, uh, may have been proposed in 1970s or 1980s. There's no harm, we can definitely cite. Uh, but um, we would expect at least, at least, at least, uh, at least about 40% latest uh, papers, latest five years papers in the citation. In pro rationale, you fail to prove the rationale or importance why you like to uh, conduct the research. Uh, flaws in methodology, lack of interpretation. Uh, this is very common among the students. Uh, what we do, we collect data, we use certain softwares, we analyze the data, and we just present the findings. And we fail to interpret. Uh, interpret. We just say this happens rejected, accepted, that's it. Uh, we do, don't continue from there. So once you have the output, there are so many things are there that can be interpreted and relating to the kind of research problem, research question that we have. In, in our research. <clears throat> Inappropriate, incomplete statistics. Uh, this is also common for newcomers. Uh, Sometimes, uh, because when you run uh, the software, basically you have to understand the softwares are basically uh, designed in a way you put anything in, it will run. Eh? We say garbage in, garbage out. So any data you put them in, it will run. Uh, but we have to understand uh, which statistical method is used for what. Okay. For example, if you have uh, two categories uh, of independent and you are running a continuous dependent variable, you can run t-test, you can run chi-square, right? If you have more than two, then you might be moving to ANOVA, right? If you have continuous independent and continuous dependent, you might be proceeding to regression. So there are many different ways of looking at, depending on the kind of data that we have. And also, a different software is used for different kind of analysis, okay? So it depends on the kind of data that you have. 
And there's a lot of debate on the SPACs versus PLS. A lot of debates versus AMOs and STATA. So this all you've got to understand uh, will uh, uh, run the data, you know, after collection of data. Review as field of knowledge and depletion. Uh, sometimes I get even fed up, you know. Uh, sometimes you will see a reviewer is recommending something I feel is totally useless, uh, not relevant at all, not useful at all, but still we got to be very courteous with the reviewers because we want our paper to be published and somehow we have to address uh, the reviewers comment that is raised uh, during the period okay uh inappropriateness of uh, for the journal i think that's the first one i mentioned earlier the out of the scope uh, when you choose a journal for your publication outlet please make sure you read carefully read carefully the scope of the journal the scope of the journal eh? so if if your paper research falls in the scope that is defined by the journal they will publish otherwise paper will get rejected hey. okay now uh, what makes a journal a high impact journal huh? the the impact of a journal is measured by impact factor point as well as indexing so uh, if a journal is indexed in ISI, is Corpus, Web of Science, uh, even uh, Excellence in Research in Australia era uh, is, uh, I think somebody is saying that uh, he cannot uh, hear. I think you, you, you are hearing properly, right? You can listen to me, right? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay, okay, thank you. So uh, ISI, is Corpus, Web of Science era, uh, these are the, very important ones. Uh, if you are publishing paper here, uh, then it is considered uh, that you are publishing paper in a very good outlet. Okay. Um, how impact factors are cal calculated, I don't think I'm going to show that. Okay. So basically, when you are choosing a journal, uh, if it is possible, uh, make sure that a journal, the journal that you choose is uh, indexed in ISI, is Corpus, Web of Science, or ERA, or at least Bookways, Econ Lead, and uh, you know. Uh, Google Scholar, uh, those, those are there. Okay? Now, uh, what is important for you to know is a paper in a high impact journal does not, does not huh, necessarily, I'm sorry, please don't request me to allow it to annotate. It, 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 it will give me some problems. I have to decline. Sorry. So, a paper in a high impact journal does not necessarily equate with a high impact paper. Huh? <laughs> this is Trigal and Trigal 2007. Uh, they have done research and they have concluded that publishing in a high impact journal does not necessarily mean you have uh, an impact paper, high impact paper. Okay, it's not, it's not. Because whether your paper is a high impact paper or not, depending on the reading and citation by the scholars. Okay, so therefore, it is essential to evaluate the impact of the individual paper and take into account, you know, take into account where it was published and how well. It has been cited and by whom, even who are citing your papers also important. Okay. So the benefit of the authors of publishing in a high profile journal is the anticipation that the article will have greater visibility and therefore more likely to be cited. So that's important. Huh? Now, uh, there are many good journals available where the access is closed, not open access journal. Uh, you should not be publishing. You try, you try. You should try to avoid those journals because people have to buy the paper and read then only decide. So your citation opportunities are less. So when you are publishing a paper in a journal, make sure it is an open access journal. So that will give you the opportunity of the visibility and more citation. And that makes you your paper as a impactful paper, okay? My paper, which is highly cited now, uh, I think about 600 citation, one paper. And that's the high citation I think I have for one paper. And that journal was not an Iscopus Index journal when I published it, okay? It was not. <laughs> so it was not an Iscopus Index journal, and yet I got the highest citation from that journal. So that's how it means. Huh? So you got to be very careful when you are talking about high impact uh, journal. Now, when it comes to high impact paper, uh, we in, for academia, it is based on citation. It's based on citation. It is based on contribution to new knowledge. Well, uh, we, we do uh, determine whether your uh, paper is a highly cited paper and whether you are a highly cited researcher, whether your papers are impactful paper or not, looking at the Hays index. 
phase index is basically, for example, if I say, uh, say for example, you have published 10 papers, but only five papers got cited by five, more than five. So your H index is five. Say, for example, you have published 20 papers and then you've got only 10 papers cited more than 10 times. So your H index would be 10. An I-10 index is basically uh, when a paper is cited more than 10 times, it's already I-10. So if I publish 20 papers and uh, say, for example, uh, five papers are cited more than 10 times, then we'll say you have I-10 index five, five right? I-10 index is five. So that's what you look at. So that's why many times uh, people will ask you, people will ask you, uh, what is your H index? Uh, that's the question. Which index? That basically tells you how impactful author you are uh, looking at his index. Uh, like myself, I think my H index is about 30, uh, about 30, about 30, meaning that uh, I have 30 papers cited more than 30 times, uh, at least 30 papers cited more than 30 times. So that is H index 30. Okay. Now, uh, on the other hand, um, the industry, industry, when they look at whether your paper is an impactful paper or not, uh, looking at the relevance of your paper, practicability of uh, the findings and the policy recommendation that you made and the usefulness of your paper. Okay, so now uh, when we would like to see your paper, we look at from both perspective. We look at from academic perspective and we'll also look from industry perspective. So from both way, it should be impactful and that makes it an impactful paper and that makes you an impactful researcher, okay? Uh, now let us begin huh? how to write a paper. Uh, Brother Abdullah basically told me that I have to uh, be hands-on telling uh, for the beginners even. Huh? So I hope those of you are very good author will be here with me for some time. Uh, for the newcomers, uh, uh, I'll be focusing on newcomers now. Planning uh, your article, okay? So you may plan to write two different kind of paper. The first group of paper, we call it concept paper or review papers. The beginners, I will always encourage you to do that. And those are very experienced. I think you should be focusing on here, not on empirical paper. The very, very experienced one will write concept paper. You have new knowledges and uh, you are so experienced uh, with wisdom and experience and all that. You should be able to write good concept paper and people will buy that. People will follow it. Uh, the companies will be taking it as a policy uh, making uh, paper, policy making papers, concept paper. Concept paper or review paper can be easily written for the PhD students. If you have completed chapter one, two, three, introduction, literature, review, and research methodology, you can already write a concept paper. Okay, you can write a concept paper. So the structure of a concept paper would be like introduction. That's where I will say what you're supposed to write in introduction later, followed by literature review, and finally, methodology and a conclusion. So in the conclusion, you tell basically people once this research is completed, you are expected to contribute this and that, okay? So here in your research method, possibly in the literature review, at the end of literature review, you are going to propose a new theoretical or conceptual framework. That is the contribution. And that's why your paper would be published, okay? So in the introduction or uh, background of this study, you are going to introduce the topic and uh, uh, define the research problem, uh, introducing the research questions. And then you review literature by 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 guided through the research questions you have, and then you have a proposed research methodology. And finally, the conclusion will tell me basically once you complete, we're expecting this this kind of new knowledge from this research. So that could be a concept paper or review paper. If you are writing concept paper or review papers, you should be publishing it in a. Uh, you should be first of all submitting in a uh, conference, and then you get feedback, make make improvements, and publish in journals. Uh, so far, I have published, uh, I think most of my PhD students, they publish at least one concept paper. Huh? So when you are submitting, going through your proposal defense, you should be already writing a concept or review papers. If you are a very good researcher, uh, you had a lot of experience of publishing paper, then you should be also focusing here. Your original novel ideas can be expressed in a concept paper. And uh, many good journals in the world, leading journals, they prefer concept paper rather than empirical papers, all right? Now, the second group of paper, that's where most of us, we uh, concentrate, empirical paper. This is written based on uh, the findings of research. So we collect data, we analyze, and then we compare with the previous findings, and finally, we make a conclusion. So this is 
easily can this can be easily written huh? based on the uh, the data you know uh, collection and analysis data. now uh, there is a big difference of these two group of paper concept paper if somebody is very experienced writing policy making type of papers then your english language proficiency must be very very good huh? but for the for the newcomers if you are writing a review paper it doesn't matter whatever english language proficiency we have we provide huh? you can go for a conference get feedback make improvement submit in a journal for publication all right, so how should we write? Uh, so the primary criteria for high impact journal articles are accuracy and clarity. Uh, that's the beginning, uh, accuracy and clarity. So the first step for clarity is good organization and standardized format of a journal. Please understand that every journal has their own formatting. Every journal has their own formatting. So when you are opening up a journal website, read through the instructions given to the authors. Understand it. Understand the scope, uh, that's one I mentioned at the first slide. Understand the scope of the journal. When you find that your paper suits this journal, then immediately after look at the instructions given, organize the paper the way they want it. Format the paper the way they want it. Okay, so you have to understand it very well. Okay, and the second uh, step definitely the clarity. Uh, you, have to, you have to write in simply and directly. Okay, so we'll be talking about that a lot afterwards. Okay. So a journal article uh, tells a straightforward story. Uh, I said earlier, a, a paper is basically telling and selling the story, okay? Of a predefined problem that you have and you are trying to find out the solutions. And it is not novel with subplots, uh, flashbacks, and literary allusions, but short story with a single linear narrative line. Remember, you, you, if you are doing a PhD, you may have four or five research questions. So every research question that you have, you can write a paper, okay? So from one PhD thesis, you can easily write six, seven, eight papers. And some of my PhD students, one of my PhD students has written 11 papers, Scopus Index, huh? journal papers. So it depends, right? So it has to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you just choose a single narrative uh, line and then you continue with that a small story, a small research problem and you focus on it and you continue the process. And you, you collect data, you do the analysis, you have the findings, you write up, and you continue. Okay? Now, while you are writing a paper, the first thing that you got to keep in mind is uh, who is the audience, right? After, uh, sorry, the second thing, after finalizing which journal are you going to publish, then immediately you should focus on the audience. Good writing is good teaching, huh? because when you are writing, people are going to read. And when they are not going to read only, you know, they are going to annotate or they are going to summarize. And they're going to take important things from your paper and they're going to, uh, uh, you know, cite things in your, uh, uh, in their paper. So we say that academic journals are published in specialized audiences who share common background of substantial knowledge and methodological experts. So if you are writing a paper on human resource management, basically most of the audience who are going to read your paper are from human resource management area. If you are writing a, a paper from, say, microelectronics, so readers would be... Uh, or background with microelectronics, right? So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, who are the audience? Uh, um, but we say, however, articles should be written to make it comprehensible to the widest possible audience, okay? And with even the relevance, uh, relevant industry in mind. So when you are writing the paper, of course, you are writing for a specialist in the area. And as well as the beginner, right? As somebody who is very... Uh, Somebody is very, 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 you know, wise and very experienced in the area and uh, anything he reads, he understands. But remember, think of yourself and myself. Huh? When we started doing the first research during the MBA time, and we started reading the first paper in our life, how was it? <laughs> it was so painful, right? It was so painful. Uh, I read a few lines and I had to consult with the dictionary to understand. And then after two, uh, three, uh, you know, pages, and I just give up. I say, no, this is not for me. <laughs> so I get back another time. Then I, I read again, you know, and try to understand it. So it, it took me even one to two weeks to read and understand one paper. So that's how it is. We have to keep that in mind. The beginners, they are not expert in the area. So the language that we choose, uh, the words, uh, the jargons that we choose should be understandable. By people. So we make it as comprehensible, uh, you know, widest possible audience as possible, okay? So that anybody can read and understand. I will focus a bit on that also afterwards, okay? I do have slides uh, to focus on that. Now, uh, when you're writing paper, basically you are telling a good story. You've got to be a very good storyteller. 
Uh, you're going to start with the problem. Uh, I always give an example of watching a movie. Uh, when you watch a movie, you start with some kind of storyline. And it goes on. And you will have many fictions and dramas and all that. Finally, you end up, right? You cry. You end up crying uh, after watching the movie. Or you start uh, laughing and being uh, satisfied of watching the movie, okay? So you got to be a very good storyteller when writing the paper. Because when a person open up your paper, first introduction he reads, if he likes, he'll continue. If he doesn't, he'll just... Throw it. Looking at the title itself, first the title will give the first impression. Look at the title, he likes it. Okay, I'll continue. Then he goes to the abstract. He likes it, he'll continue. It looks at the introduction. It looks, looks very good and looks to be very important, looks to be very relevant to me. So he will continue. So you have to somehow make yourself a good storyteller. Okay? Anybody who did see, understand it, the flow and sequence of ideas are described in a way. They feel like it's something worthy and they feel like interesting to read. You know, it's like a friction. Story books that we did. Okay. So we have to make our journal article a compelling story. We have to address interesting problem, phenomena, or you know, phenomena that is uh, somehow attracts many people, and then using theories developed to explain issues. So we find out interesting problem phenomena and then we go ahead with some kind of theories that we have. That's what we do when we watch movie, right? Um, if it's straightforward, if you see the love story at the beginning and end like that, uh, nobody is going to watch. People watch because you see the dramas, drama after drama, drama after drama. That's how a paper should be written. Storytelling, you know, a plot after plot, you know, a dramatizing of write-up. That's what is very important that we have to learn. That's what I was saying, the art of writing the paper. Okay, you've got to be a very good storyteller. Okay, so in some... Our article should have a story, you know, some you know, a strong storyline that provide an easily remembered take-home message. Uh, that's very important. Uh, many of us, you know, we listen to sermons, uh, some speeches, and after listening to that, uh, when you finish it up, and we try to remember what did I learn, and and many times I will find, hey, I did not learn anything from this speech, but the, the speaker was very humorous. Uh, I love the way he talks, but did I learn anything? I did not learn anything. Huh? And sometimes you will find a speaker, not very good speaker. Uh, I somehow managed to finish listening to him. And then I close my eyes and see, hey, did I learn anything? And so, yeah, there's so many things I learned from him. Okay. So a paper should be written in a way, keeping in mind the audience, that audience should get something from me. Unfortunately, as an academic, we are so under stress of increasing the number of publications, number of papers. We don't keep that in mind. We just want to write something and get it published. Done. <laughs> if that is the attitude, then uh, we should not be writing a paper. Huh? We should not be writing a paper. We should be writing paper for people in a way so that people get something from my paper. Okay, take home messages from my paper. So we should have a clear answer to the following questions. <clears throat> what has the paper told me that I did not know before? So when a reader read your paper, after that, he try to find out what is new to me. After reading this paper, did I get something new? Okay, now, if you are doing a PhD and you are reading 200 papers, all 200 papers must be different, am I right? It should be, right? It should be. Every paper is supposed to have something new because research are done at different period, at different contexts, at different countries, using different problems and, and many other things. Okay. So any paper is written, we have to keep in mind what audience, the reader, going to get something from me. We have to keep that in mind. Rather than, I want to write a paper, I want to get it published. That's it. I don't want anything more than that. If top of that, if some people cite me, oh, excellent. <laughs> I think most majority of authors nowadays, researchers, have developed this kind of mentality, which is unacceptable. We should be writing something to let people get something from us. Okay. And why is this news so important? The new thing that you are proposing, why it is so important? Okay, that is also another question. We might introduce something new, but that is not that important to people or industry or nation or the, the world. Then why should you be doing that? Okay, so that one also we have to keep in mind. Now, uh, that's what I have mentioned earlier, that you should not be having too many subplots. Right? You should not be having too many subplots. Okay, so you, you just tell one story. Uh, of course, when you watch movie, 
A story is one. Uh, if it's a love story, it's just about actor and actress, the love story. But in between, to dramatize it, they will have some subplots, but not too many subplots. Huh? Those of you who watch series, you know, drama series in the many countries, uh, you'll see like it goes up to like serial uh, up to 100, 200. Uh, after watching five, six, you will just give up. Uh, too many subplots. So, same goes to a research paper. Uh, remember, we want audience, the reader, to do something for me and remember that. Okay, take something easily from my paper and put that in their paper and cite me. That's what I want. Okay, so if you have too many things, they are not going to, you know, they are not going to sell, cite so many things that you have. Okay, it's impossible. Okay, participants, uh, those of you with me now, uh, possibly, if you don't mind, can you share this uh, a session with the Facebook, your own Facebook, so that uh, many other people would be benefited. All right, thank you very much. Okay, now the next would be creating an outline. Uh, of a paper okay so before we begin writing we have to have an outline right we have to have an outline so especially for the introduction and general discussion because we have in mind of the research question okay um so these are the questions that i i, I keep it for you as huh? what points are critical for the introduction that is important what points are critical uh, because people would like to see something they want to take back home right uh, Sorry, uh, somehow I think my presentation got off. So let me try again. Uh, okay, somebody's uh, sharing. Uh, Daud Sulaiman, can you please stop sharing, please? Daud Salman, if he doesn't st stop, uh, please uh, take him out from the group. Daud Salman, please stop sharing. If you continue sharing, I cannot share my slide. Okay. Thank you. Can you see me now? My slide? Better. Someone, okay, okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Someone has to respond, otherwise I... <laughs> Okay, brothers, uh, that, uh, it's all right. I think it's mistakenly done. They understood. Okay. So, what are uh, what points are critical uh, for the introduction? What is the logic we are building for our research? Huh? There, there, there's a plot that you are creating for a story at the beginning. Huh? So, you are you are starting to create the story. So, that, that's very very important. In the beginning, you have to have the storyline, right? Uh, when people produce movie, they produce a small storyline. You know. They start with a very small storyline and then, then proceed from there. Same goes to a paper. You have a small storyline, okay? And from there, you continue, okay? So the method is usually straightforward. You have a schema, right? An outline uh, that is useful, okay? And later, we continue from there. So we need to consider the order of presentation. Should research outcome be presented in a table figure in the text? The general discussion needs to be clear and all that, all right? So I'll have more discussion. So I won't uh, skip the time here. This is something that uh, I saw in the social media and I've taken from you. Uh, for you, some of you may have seen it. This is a kind of pyramid that uh, an author has proposed, which I like. Huh? You start with abstract, uh, then abstract should include this problem, indication, and methodology, main findings, and principal con conclusion, right? So that's the abstract. And then you have introduction. You can see introduction is supposed to be quite wide. Okay. And then your literature review. Then your methodology, your result, discussion, okay? So if you look at discussion, it, it starts in, enlarging, right? Extending from introduction to evaluation to conclusion. And then you have the acknowledgement and references, all that, okay? So uh, I, I don't think I'm going to discuss uh, from this uh, slide. I just wanted to show you this pyramid being proposed by uh, someone, okay? Let's start, huh? hands on now. <laughs> selection of a good title, okay? Selection of a good title. And this is, uh, I say that um, the first impression is the last impression. A person looking at uh, a person looking at the uh, title uh, will decide whether he would like to uh, publish paper, whether he'd like to continue reading your paper or not, okay? Uh, so it's very important to have a sketchy, sketchy, right? Uh, something like a catchy title, uh, interesting uh, title of a paper. It should not be too long. Uh, it's about 15 words, uh, not more than that, 15 yeah. words uh, maximum. Uh, 
Uh, most of the journal will give you that guideline of uh, how many words of a uh, title uh, would be accepted, okay? So most readers is skimming the table of contents uh, or outline in a journal and look into the title, okay? And also sometimes they look at the author's name also. <laughs> so looking at the title, they will decide whether they would like to continue reading or not. So if you are lucky, then uh, uh, they might continue um, they might continue reading your abstract after looking at the title. Huh? So if they don't like the title, they may not continue. So there's nothing we can do about the names, but we can control our title and our abstract, right? Our names are there. Whether I have a good name in the industry or not, it doesn't matter. That one, I cannot do anything, right? So what I can do only, I can I can propose a catchy title, attractive title, okay, and attractive abstract. That may, uh, people may continue with that, okay? It's like, you know, when you are falling in love with a boy or a girl, um, you have to remember why you fall in love with, with someone. There's something there, right? Attractive. <laughs> That's the paper title. That's the paper title. Okay. So the title should be about uh, 15 words and it should be full explanatory and it's standing alone and uh, it should, the title itself uh, should identify the theoretical issues and variable under investigation. Okay. So title itself will tell you the issues of the research, the problem of the research can be understood by looking at the title itself. Okay? It gives impression, first impression to the reader. So we say the title comes in many flavors. One basic uh, form is uh, looking at the effect of independent to the dependent variable. This is very common for the beginner. This is nothing wrong with that, okay? However, we say that uh, titles do not exactly leap out at the reader saying, read me now. Huh? So if you have independent variable to dependent variable, uh, people will just say, okay, uh, something okay, something I know uh, in this area, I've seen that before. <laughs> So that may not be like, read me now kind of a title. So title should be like very, you know, catchy, attractive. Uh, it's like, I should read now. Huh? I should read now. <laughs> so that kind of title you should be selecting. So some academics, they love to have uh, colons in, in the title, which is not a good, good idea, good, not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea because uh, you can have a, a double story uh, or double barrel, double barrel title in a single title. Which is okay, huh? which is not bad, not bad. Huh? Now let's proceed to abstract. So we have gone through the title. Now we proceed to abstract. Abstract is the most important part of a research. And it is written after writing the whole paper. Okay. <laughs> um, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, most of the conferences will ask you to submit abstract first. This is a common practice. And I will tell many, I will ask many conference organizers, how can I write the abstract when I have not completed my research yet? I have not conducted the analysis and I do not have the findings yet. How do you expect you to write the abstract for the conference? Well, uh, this is a formality that we have to do. So we have a title and abstract we submit to the conference. And later when you have a full paper, we submit the full paper together with the revised abstract. No problem. So the first abstract you have submitted, when you submit finally, you will make changes after the real findings and all that you have, okay? So abstract is a place that actually gives you the big chance to entice readers to the article. They, they love your, you know, the, the, the abstract, they continue, okay? So usually we'll have the APA, um, uh, APA uh, pub publication manual, and you have to follow that most of the journal. Uh, most of the journal will prefer to have like 120 words and uh, it may go up to 200 words, not more than that. This is very challenging. Huh? This is very challenging. I see it is arduous and challenging. Very challenging. For me, when I started writing paper, most of my abstract was having like 500 words, 400 words, and I did not know which sentences to be dropped. Was very challenging. Was very challenging. For me even, huh? I think most of you have that difficulty um, making um, a compressed, concise, precise uh, uh, abstract. Okay, this is something very important. Okay, so it, it cannot be usually more than 200. Some journal I have seen up to 250 words is acceptable. Okay, so we have to learn to focus on that. When you start writing abstract, do not write stories. Straightforward, go to the objective of the research. Straightforward. Okay, and then some other points I'm going to discussed later okay so in the abstract we must state the problem or issues of interest say something about the methods used 
provide independent dependent variables, specify the results obtained, provide digital conclusion. Okay. So, and then perhaps end with a pity statement of what all, what it all means. Okay. So this is the structure of the abstract. So you are going to have, basically you are going to highlight the research problem or issues of interest. Then you will talk about a bit of research method used. Then you are going to provide what are the variables identified and listed. Then how did you get your results? You know, you specify the results, what kind of results you got. And then you make a conclusion in, in, uh, in, 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 in relevance to the theories that you have proposed. That's what I'm going to give you something new. Okay. Now, uh, we said that because writers need to pack so much into an abstract, careful writing and repeated revisions are required. Uh, abstract is the one, as remember, we said uh, if, if the abstract is boring, sort of, and uh, not very attractive, not interesting, uh, people may not continue reading your papers anymore. So, if you are writing abstract first time, uh, to me, even until now, when I write an abstract, Usually, I will need five, six times of reviewing, and finally, I will be happy with that. Okay. So, if you are writing the abstract, share with your friends, your academic uh, mentors, advisors, and get some feedback from them, and then you keep modifying and, and fine tuning. And finally, you, you, when you feel like you are very happy, you can really see, you know, what, what is written and understandable. Then only you should proceed. And then please remember that uh, in the abstract, no citation are allowed. Huh? You should not be making any citations, all going to be your own words. You are going to write abstract on your own. Huh? This part is completely on your own, summarizing the whole research into a simple uh, uh, 20 to 20 words long statement, okay? A few statements, paragraph. This is an example of uh, abstract. Uh, you can see how small. This is one of the paper that I published, uh, I think about uh, 10 years before, okay? The title was Critical Factors Impacting Sustainability of Continuous Improvement in the Manufacturing Industries in Malaysia. You can see the title itself. Uh, there are many things there that may attract people. Critical Factors, Sustainability of Continuous Improvement in huh? the Manufacturing Industry. So looking at the title itself may attract people. And then when I wrote the abstract, you can see I started straight to the objectives. The purpose of this research was to investigate the influence of six variables, namely so I start, you know, straight to the point, what I wanted to do, and then beat up method, variable identified, and the conclusion, the significance of the findings that I have. And every abstract that you write, you need to have keywords. Keywords, at least five keywords. Keywords are very important, are very important. Not many authors sometimes will understand and put importance into it. When people try to search paper, they search paper based on keywords. So your keywords, if it matches the person who is looking for papers in that area, he will get the paper. So it's very important, huh? keywords, very important. Your paper would be identified based on the keywords. So in a Google Scholar, these are the keywords would be typed in when they, key, you know, when they upload this paper. So when I want to find out the paper, I will type this word, then I'll get this paper. Sustainability, if somebody kick, they will get my paper somewhere. Okay, continuous improvement. If you write, you will get this paper somewhere because there could be hundreds and thousands of paper given by search. So you will find this paper there. But if you put continuous improvement and Muhammad Aminul Islam together, you might find it faster. Okay, so this is an example of uh, a journal. This is another example. This is very long, eh? quite long. This is uh, a, a, a paper published uh, in MRL Journal. MRL Journal has constructed uh, abstract, you know, they have a different system of writing abstract. They will ask you to write the purpose, then design, methods, approach, findings, limitation, implication, practical implications, and then originality. That's they want you to write. That's the way they want you to write. Okay. So there are journals also. So do accept more than 250 or 200 words. Okay. Even some MRL journals or in the science, the two quite reputed a group of, uh, you know, the journals are published by these two groups, MRL and uh, in the science. And these uh, journals are basically free, right? Cost free, uh, free uh, of cost publication journals. Okay, so this is another example of abstract. This is also one of my paper that is published in MRL. Okay, and this is how we wrote the abstract. So there are different kind of uh, different ways of writing abstract. You have to keep in mind. It all depends on which journal you are submitting. Earlier I said that, right? Make sure you read the instructions given by the journal. 
Okay, so I have done with the title, I'm done with the abstract. So let us move into the next part. What is it? Introduction of the paper. Okay, so this is the first task of an article to introduce the background and the nature of the problem being is investigated. So you are introducing the topic to the reader and the nature of problem you are investigating. Okay, uh, introduction should motivate the paper. So now you start letting people to continue. Huh? After abstract, you let them continue. So appropriately citing critical prior contributions. So now here you are citing the most important papers at the beginning, huh? To tell people that actually you are well versed in that area of research. Okay. So we said the first thing that you need to do is to review your introduction. Okay. So the introduction has to be effective enough to keep the readers focused on the contents. Okay. And uh, one needs to be maintained uh, the length of the introduction. It should not be more than a page unless until you have a very long paper okay uh, usually a research paper would be about 10 to 15 pages long huh? but there are papers i've seen up to 50 pages long depends on the what kind of journal you are submitting and uh, looking at the instructions given by the journal okay but personally i wouldn't expect you to have long introduction unless the introduction you make it as introduction and literature review you don't have a separate chapter paragraph for literature review then your introduction could be longer there's no problem with that. Okay, uh, I have seen many uh, write-up by many distinguished authors. Uh, they propose that there should not be a different section for literature review for an empirical for an empirical paper. So in that case, uh, you can uh, uh, embed your introduction and literature review together. So introduction could be a bit longer. And so we should take time and space necessary to lead them up to formal and theoretical statement of the problem step by step. So. At the end of your introduction, your research problem is clearly defined and people can see what is going to be done in the next few uh, pages. Okay, so do do we have to describe research objective research questions here? Not necessarily, uh, not necessarily. So I have seen the newcomers, they will just start writing. These are the objectives one, two, three, four, five. Not necessarily. You can just describe the issues related to the research problem. Highlight the research problem should be enough Okay, for introduction. So these are what uh, we, we need to have an introduction, okay? I uh, need to have the research question uh, or research questions, importance of the study, begin with the topic sentence, brief summary of the issues, concise review of literature, study approach, and what will your article add? What are you going to add in the, in the literature, in the body of knowledge, okay? So this should be there in the introduction, okay? This should be there in the introductions. If you have all these in the introduction, then um, your introduction is going to be very interesting and attractive and people might continue reading your paper okay so this is an example of uh, how you should be writing uh, an introduction of a paper okay so you can see i have written here individuals differ radically from one another in degree to which they are willing and able to express their emotions then next sentence indeed the popular view of that emotion expressively in a, is a central difference between men and women but the racist evidence is mixed okay so i'm creating i'm creating you know unfolding the drama unfolding the drama I'm starting with the plot and i'm continuing okay so then then we say this is even some evidence that men actually uh, do this or so men actually differs from women in this okay so and finally i'm saying in this study we decoded the emotional evidence of both men and women to film and then we continue so that's how the flow should be we say good flow and logical sequence. So I'm writing in a way like first sentence connecting the second sentence, third sentence connecting the second sentence, and it continues. The flow continues like that. Okay, so that's the art of writing that we have to learn, and then that will make reader to read our our, our work. Okay. All right. So I'm done with that. Um, the title, abstract, and introduction. And uh, as I said, if introduction includes the literature then you may not have a literature review uh, 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 chapter separate uh, sections in a paper. But if you do have literacy review sections, then uh, these are the some suggestions that I'm making. Okay. So after opening, after making the opening statements, we need to summarize the current state of knowledge in the area of investing. Current state of knowledge means what have been done. No, no, What, what have been done and what have not been done. That's what we have to. No, 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 no. no. Um, uh, okay. 
give me give me a few seconds to Just give me uh, one minute, can you please? Um, the moderator, just give me one minute break. <clears throat> Okay, while uh, Prof takes a, a one minute break, uh, we will want to draw the attention of participants that attendance form will be posted officially by the organizers of this program. It is expected that all participants registered on the attendance for you to get uh, e certificate and order. Uh, materials like this uh, program please endeavor to fill the attendance uh, we are going to post it now from the organizers of this program thank you Um, it appears that some people have already posted some uh, attendance sheet already. Those attendance are not from the organizers, please. Please, those attendance are not from the organizers. The organizers will post the uh, original attendance sheet now for every participant to register. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, so I was saying that if, in case if you are not uh, putting uh, the literature review in the introduction, then you may have a separate right uh, literature review chapter. So we summarize the current state of knowledge in the area of investigation. Previous research work, pertinent theory should be highlighted and summarized. And then a critical review rather than exhaustive historical review uh, should be there, all right, in the literature review. Now, the content of a critical review, okay, so basically literature review should include the key academic theories. Uh, the current knowledge should be demonstrated, right? Uh, clear referencing to the reader, and uh, we have to acknowledge the other work, right? Uh, so the content of a critical review should also increase, you know, include uh, up-to-date understanding of the research uh, subject that we have, uh, identifying the kind of research methods that have been used, uh, then existing formulation of research topic questions, and uh, should provide the, 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 the basis for subsequent uh, uh, research findings uh, that you are going to compare, okay? Now, uh, this is another way of looking at it uh, to make your life easy. Uh, if, if you are in a research world already, you know uh, the theoretical framework whereby you have dependent and independent variable, moderating variable. So you should start literature review with dependent variable. Introducing your topic, uh, your topic and theme of research is dependent variable and flows down to independent and followed by moderating and so on, okay? So this is one approach. Um, this is also proposed by the hourglass model, right? So your introduction is uh, uh, includes the literature review. Uh, this is like if your paper is uh, say 15 pages long, then uh, five, 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 five pages would be like that, right? And then methods and uh, results are not that uh, extensively discussed. Your discussion collaboration would be would be more. Okay. Now, uh, when you are writing your literature review, you have to make sure you you make your voice clear. Uh, the problem is most of the time with the with the newcomers especially is uh, they just get from people and they just write it without their own views and <laughs> no argument. So you have to have a different perspective from different researchers and then you have to have your own perspective. So you have to debate, you have to debate issues 
that there. Okay, so when you read papers, uh, you will find the same thing being concluded as negative, positive, and send it. Some say no evidence. So you will have the debate on, and then finally you have to make a point. Okay, so you have to make your voice very clear when you are writing literature review. Okay, so theoretical position also like you got so many different theories can explain the research problem you have. But you are going to pick up only one theory or two, three theories. Okay, so either you have one theory, under three theories, or you are integrating of two, three theories. So you got to clear. You got to clear your understanding and your voice should be very clear. Okay, your language should indicate your assessment of the literature. So the way you write, people will understand whether you have assessed the literature properly or not. Okay. So there are different way of um, outlining uh, uh, literature. This is another approach. Uh, you can have chronologically presented literature. So you start with the theory, say proposed in 70, and followed by 1780s and 90s and uh, the 21st century, whatever the papers. So you follow the chronological order. And you can embed this with thematic one. Huh? But our paper, you follow the thematic one. So you go with dependent variable, then independent variable followed by you know moderating and all that. So when you are going through thematic, you have to combine with chronological. Under each theme, you go chronological order. Okay, so that's how I would prefer. Okay, and I think that is most in the, uh, 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 the advisable way of writing literature review, even for your PhD thesis. Okay, <laughs> and certain theses are too much on methodological issues are there. In that case, uh, you may follow focus on methodological than chronological. Okay. And then certain things will be also too much of theoretical emphasis. Then you can follow theoretical, then you combine with chronological. So there are four different approaches of writing a literature review. So it can be chronological, could be thematic, could be methodological, could be theoretical. All four can be combined depending on the kind of research problem we have. Or we may just combine two to write our literature review. Okay. Now these are some examples uh, that I, I, I have given. I will share the slide with the organizer. And organizers will be sharing the slide with you. And also, this video will be available in my YouTube channel. When I put up the YouTube channel, under the YouTube channel, I will also attach this slide for you. So don't worry. Keep an eye in my YouTube channel. It is going to be uploaded there. And under the YouTube channel also, you will have the slide in case if you don't get from the organizers. But I'm sure the organizer will share the slides with you. So this is an example of a week literature review. Uh, this is an acceptable, you know, uh, literature review, which I'm not going to read because it's going to take a long time, okay? Um, now, so I have done with the title, Abstract Introduction Literature Review. The next section is what? The methods, the methodology, okay? So in methodology, what should we include? The first one is important, right? Uh, we have to have the sample population, sampling method, data collection method, data analysis method, all has to be elaborated. Uh, the description of variable assays, that's where you will have operational definitions of variable and how they have been measured, okay, got to be also mentioned under the methodology. And description of theoretical framework. So basically, we'll start with theoretical framework and hypothesis, followed by uh, the description of variables and followed by the sample population and all that, okay. So there, there, there are different ways of describing it. So these are the three elements that must be, must be described in the methodology chapter. There are many things here, okay? So let me show you another slide. What should be included in the methodology? How you address your study questions, okay? Who, what, and when, and where? So these questions, answers of this. Who had this, uh, the, the, the sample population? And uh, then, then, you know, when when did you conduct your research? Where the, 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 the context, the premise of research, what should be there? And then some recipes uh, for others to repeat. For example, you are using some instruments which are completely new and some people can replicate later with that, okay? Type of research design, uh, the data sources, outcome to be measured, and uh, also you have to describe the statistical method you are going to use. So earlier I have shown you one um, uh, slide. This is here, and this is another one that uh, make you understand what uh, is, should be included in the methodology chapter. And it, that, it should be followed by results section presenting your foundation uh, findings, discussion section, conclusion recommendations, okay? Now, what should be in the result chapter or result section? Uh, we have to detail individuals included or excluded. Why you have chosen certain people in the sample and why you have not chosen, okay? Demographic characteristics of the study group, 
the results of analysis, statistical significance, okay, the tables and figures, uh, then consider supplemental digital content of online posting, and then report. Huh? Do not interpret. Here, basically, you are not going to interpret the results. Okay? So these are the subsections. Okay, uh, These are the elements that should be. They should be included in the results section. But after the results section, of course, we will have a discussion. Or if you want to combine uh, results and discussion together possible, so while you are describing the results, immediately you have some discussion. So what do you do in the discussion? Uh, basically, here you will summarize the findings. You compare findings with the previous research. So if you do not have a literature review chapter in a paper, here you will have a lot of citations. Okay, You are comparing your findings with the previous researches. You are talking about implications. And that's where the, 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 the new researchers or new authors would be, new writers would be very weak in it. We just describe the results and we fail to tell people what are the implications of the findings. Okay, so this is what you have to do. Here you can have theoretical implications, you can have uh, practical implications, you may have some implication for the policy makers and all that got to be highlighted in the discussion chapter. Okay, and then you will have also some limitations got to be highlighted and the recommendations for actions. Okay, so that's how we uh, write a discussion paper and then add up a, a paper. Okay. So these are the some tips. Um, it has to be uh, short and sweet, right? It has to be keep in short and sweet. Okay. I have talked about it earlier, so let me skip that. Do not paralyze readers with the results section. Sometimes, since you have run the statistic, you have so much of output. We have tendency. Many authors have a tendency of writing too long and uh, attaching with the statistical results. Okay. Uh, rather, we should be avoiding too much of the statistics, and we put it in sentences and letting people understand it also so that's what you say simply it is a uh, telling a story kind of write up okay all right um okay this is important be aware of uh, cards of knowledge what happens you know when you do research we make some read some papers and we understand a bit of uh, the area of research and we feel like i'm the father of knowledge huh? <laughs> i know more than anyone nobody knows like what i know and that gives you the temptation of writing in a way uh, people start hating you. When you have too much of show up, people don't like it, you know, people don't like it. People like people who are humble. See, so if you want to share something, you're totally humble. So when you describe the findings and all that, you've got to be very careful. You've got to be very careful. Huh? Uh, the second point here, we can see we may occasionally find this out when a reviewer, especially a good one, was clearly tried hard to complete the paper, face to understand some point. Yet it is so clear to us when we write it. When I write, it is very clear to me. But when a reviewer reads it, he doesn't understand what I write to me. Huh? This comes out when we use too much of jargons and we use too difficult English languages. Huh? Um, it is not about how good your English language is. It is all about whether I am being able to communicate with people. The reason I'm writing paper because I want people to read and understand and then cite me. So if I write too difficult English language, then people may not understand and they may not read and they will not sub cite me. Okay, so that's the problem. So the best cure for the cards of knowledge is to get several people to read your paper. Write the paper, give it to people to read. And I would prefer you give it to at least three people. Possibly one is your peer, somebody who is doing your PhD with you. And then you give it to your supervisor, of course, he's going to read. And beside that, another academic, someone who likes to read your work, okay? So and get feedback and then you make improvements. You just give it to a peer and let him see whether he understands. He may tell you, hey, what did you write? I don't even understand what you try to mean, you know. Uh, he will tell you, well, your supervisor will always ask you, right? Hey, what do you mean by this sentence? So this is how it is. So once you write, let people, you know, understand and uh, share some, uh, give you some feedback and then you make improvements with it, okay? Now let's move to publishing paper. So I am done with uh, writing papers, okay? I didn't touch the uh, the acknowledge, sorry, the references, uh, as you know. Uh, we mostly, we, the APA style that we follow, okay? So when you are submitting a journal, which journal should you submit to? So does the research fit to the journal aim or uh, scope? What type of submission is it? Empirical or review or brief report, okay? So you got to look at that. So when you look at the journal, uh, carefully review the scope of this journal, as I said earlier. Does the, does the research, does the journal publish this kind of paper? We have to ask us the question. Does the journal have a good reputation in the field? And are the editor, editorial board with high profile? Huh? These questions also we have to ask ourselves. I have seen some journals. The editors 
uh, and and uh, editorial board members are a PhD student. There's nothing wrong with that. But some people uh, with high stature will not be popular publishing paper in that kind of journal. Okay, so you got to be very careful. Check the references to see whether this journal of research searching uh, mainly falls in the ISI rank journal or is Copper's uh, Wave of Science and all that. Okay, so you got to find out the indexing of the journal. Does your institution have any restrictions? Malaysia, the education minister will provide us the list of blacklisted journals where we should not publish. Okay, they will guide us. So I'm sure well, most of the countries you should have that kind of policies. Your university may tell you that uh, these are the journals where we do not expect you to publish. Okay, there are universities. There are certain countries they don't care whether it is ISI, Web of Science, or Scopus, as long as it is peer-reviewed journal, it's acceptable. To me personally, I prefer that as long as a journal is a peer-reviewed journal, it's fine with me. Scopus indexing, ISI, the way of science, these all are businesses. They are a group of people making millions of dollars. And we are falling in their trap and paying money, getting it published because we want to get promoted. Okay. We need our academic career to be uplifted. And that's why we don't mind paying money to publish paper. I give you an example. There's a journal named Sustainability, published by MPDI. Switzerland, how much charge they, 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 how much money they charge? 2,200 Swiss franc. So over 2,000 US dollar for a paper. Can you imagine how much? It's more than many of your salaries. <laughs> so when you submit a paper to them, after two or three weeks, they will accept your paper without any correction, without any review. And they say that they have done two reviews. They, they will send it to review. They will accept it. And within a month, you get it published. So one of my junior called me and said, Prof, I want to publish the sustainability. I said, why? He said, it's in Q1. I said, I don't care with this Q1 or Q3 or Q4. This is a pediatric journal to me. Any paper submitted, as long as you can pay, is published. So I've seen in my country, eight, eight colleagues joined together and submitted a public paper there and published it. So they share each, they share each, you know, each of them share 200 plus US dollar. So when you call me, I say, brother, why you have to do that? Submit paper in a good channel. Even there are many paper which are free of charges. Submit there, it may take a bit longer time, maybe six months, nine months, you can wait for it. And the money that you are giving to the journal, give it to the poor people. There are millions of poor people in the society. Give it to them. It's a charity. Publish your paper for free. But if you are going to publish in a paper for for with, with some charges, find journals that is cheaper. That is cheaper. Okay, that is cheaper. Not too expensive. And it's just submitted. They just publish. It doesn't matter whether key one or key two, whether it's a good journal or reputed journal. Or that is the question. If I understand, if I submit any paper, they will publish. I know it is not a good journal. It doesn't matter whether it's key one or key two. Okay. Okay. So what is the acceptance or rejection rate? A good journal. Those are in Q1, you will see the acceptance rejection rate even up to 5%. I have seen a journal which is 4%. So 10%, 15% acceptance rate is very common. Huh? So you got to look at that also. All right. Uh, so publishing a paper. So the, this Benos, Kevin, and John 2003, they summarize the item for a uh, for, for, for review yeah, during the time. The, the quality. Checking that no mistake is uh, in procedure oh. logic has been made. The results are presented support the conclusion drawn. No error in citation to previous work. All human protocols have been described. And very importantly, the work is original and significant. This is what the pre reviewers uh, will be looking at. Eh? So I think many of you sitting with me do uh, review papers uh, as I do. So these are the things that we commonly look into when you review papers. Okay. So the basis uh, for the high impact publication would be uh, you have to select a journal carefully. Okay, be careful to follow the instructions of for authors given. Be focused. Prepare the figures that shows illustrate the main findings. Explain your findings in abstract, and then delete all irrelevant results. Okay, uh, this is another part where many students feel like anything I have just put in. Okay, so put only those are relevant you feel. Okay, and this is adopted from. Uh, Last post, right? Uh, distinguish clearly between results of your study and other others. Include good dose of education and dissemination of knowledge. Read your article at least five times. Huh? This is my uh, suggestion, basically. 
uh, read your paper at least five times and every time you will find mistakes. And now uh, you have so many uh, uh, soft toys available. You have Grammarly, you have Quillboat, you know, you have so many softwares available that help you to paraphrase, that helps you to improve uh, the English languages that, 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 that you write in your paper, okay? Now, this is another checklist uh, that may help you to eliminate some of the common problems in writing uh, uh, articles, okay? Have a specific purpose in mind, the research problem you have, know your target audience, I've talked about it earlier, develop a detailed outline first, then you continue, you stop your reader, uh, in 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 his track of your item, the item, you start your article with the most important information. Keep jargons to a minimum. Not many people understand the jargons, right? Make the article warm and personal. Keep sentences short and simple. This is another one. Uh, many authors they they they, they love to uh, uh, write in the longer sentences huh? because sometimes we think in our language and then we translate in English. Okay, so when you do that, it become too long. The beauty of language depends on how short the sentences are. You have to make every sentence shorter, uh, shorter, shorter sentences, and that sentence will be easily understood and easily read by everyone. Um, just give an example. You know, for example, like I wrote a, a sentence which is five lines long, and I wrote a sentence which is one line long or two lines long. Which one would be easily understood? Of course, the shorter one. Okay, and have someone from the target population critique your article. So you can choose somebody supposed to be a reader to read and give you some feedback uh, and before you submit okay and you spend more time you spend more time rewriting than writing okay this is very important huh? this is very important point most of the time you know we rush to write we finish off then we rush to submit we should not be doing that keep it for some time review for a few times when i submitted my completed my PhD draft every time i read i find many mistakes even the time I was submitting after the hard binding, I still found mistakes. And now when I read, I find many mistakes. Okay, So writing in one, but to fine tune it, make improvements. Like when you play football, you learn with a coach. And every day you play, you learn something. The more you play, the more you learn. So the more time you read, the more mistakes will be identified. And more correction will be done. More fine tuned paper would be. And the chances of getting your paper published should be higher. There's some other useful tips also here for you to remember. Uh, besides formatting, uh, there, there are also different formatting for different journals. So you have to understand the formatting. Be sure of some tools. Uh, I said Mendeley could be a good one. And uh, to, to, to carefully proofread, you can use uh, uh, the, the grammatical and spelling errors with the Grammarly software or the Quillboard software that help you to paraphrase uh, to avoid uh, the plagiarism. And then we say, remember, the more you write, uh, the more writing you do, the better you will get. And after some time, so in, we are in the habit of writing, article writing could be, could be just fun, you know, it's not going to be as difficult as we uh, feel now. Huh? When I started writing uh, papers at the beginning, I still remember the first paper that I submitted to a journal, the reviewer comments were like six, seven pages long. And when I look at it, the exhaustive list, I thought, oh, I don't give up. I do not want to do that correction and submit the paper again, you know. I think most of you will have the similar feeling. And when you read the first paper, you go to a conference and you get all the shots from everywhere and you get demoralized. There's no reason to be demoralized. The reason you submit a paper to a conference is to get feedback and make improvements. So be bold and face it, okay? And acknowledge the weaknesses that you have and make improvements with the paper that you have written. Of course, it's very important. You've got to be very clear on the plagiarism. You know the punishment of it. I know I, I, I had one colleague who plagiarized a full paper and who was uh, punished for 10 years uh, uh, not being able to publish his corpus in his journal. Huh? And uh, his co-authors, they were punished for five years. They were not allowed to publish in his corpus in this journal for five years for plagiarizing a full paper. So you got to be careful, right? So most of the journal, you accept up to like 10% uh, turn it in report, right? 10% 10, 10 some 15%, not more than that. PhD thesis with the university do accept up to 30%, but when it comes to paper, even some journal, may not accept even up to six, seven percent of uh, Chinese report, okay? So you got to carefully read the instruction and they be careful on uh, the plagiarism, okay? So I I hope, uh, as Brother Abdullah told me that it has to be hands-on, uh, I tried to start from the very beginning uh, for the newcomers as well for the old ones. And I started with the title later, uh, I followed an introduction, literature review, the methodology, results, and discussion, and conclusion. 
All right. So I did cover almost all parts and I have provided you some clue for publishing the papers. All right. So with that, I would like to end my presentation and I will pass the session to the moderator. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to handle uh, in case if you have any questions, I'm uh, ready to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me, please? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you can believe with me that after reading the citation of Professor MD Amin of Islam, he has proven himself beyond what the content of the citation. Prof, uh, this friendly and student, you know, friendly kind of presentation is indeed what most of us need and personally i learned uh, much and i want to most sincerely thank especially the organizers of this program for recognizing professor md amino this uh, wonderful job this is the job he does with passion if i have a word to describe professor amino uh, amino islam is one you are generous in sharing knowledge, sir. And thank you so much for that. Uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to allow you now is your own turn in case you missed some clarification, you have some questions to ask, uh, or you want to write in the chat box, you will write your own questions for Professor Amin Islam to respond. Remember, this is a golden opportunity. We may not know when shall it come again. Uh, and this is the conference workshop, one of its kind indeed. Uh, Mr. President, do we have any question from the chat box? Or uh, the participants, can you let me check the chat box? I, I think since uh, participants are on live now. Yes. Uh, I think it's, it would be good if they ask questions. Uh, by directly. The chat. Oh. Yeah, I, th I think we, we, we let them ask questions directly. Later, we look into the chat box. I would prefer okay. questions to be asked orally. Okay. So you can you can switch on your microphone. Uh, you can click on the video. Let us see you. Okay, I have over the line and you can raise the question. Mansur Bello has a question. Mansur Bello. Yes. You can you can just switch on the microphone, unmute yourself, and uh, yes, unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Ask your questions, and not mm -hmm. only questions. Okay. If right. you would like to, if you like to uh, debate on anything that I have said, if you said, feel okay. I, I, I have Assalamu done it wrong. Alaikum. Uh, good evening to you at Malaysia, and uh, afternoon to those in Nigeria and other countries. Uh, thank you very much, Prof, for our presentation. Uh, I'm very happy to join this uh, noble. My question is that uh, I, just yesterday I was discussing with a senior colleague about Likert scale. So I know we have Likert type and we have Likert scale. So when we are talking about uh, Likert scale, he made mention that it is a mandatory now. He specifically mentioned a university here in Nigeria. I don't want to mention the university that now they restricted the Likert scale to be only four Likert scale. Well, I told him that most of the Likert scale, I don't know whether it is even or odd, but I knew that most of the Likert scale uh, has this neutral, uh, neutral. that is uh, strongly disagreed, disagreed, maybe neither no disagree, never disagree, and the strongly agreed, so he said no. Now the modern uh, research said that you should always stick at four because the neutral one has any uh, has no any value, so they don't use it. So I keep wondering. I don't know who to ask. I check. I went through the literatures and I even read the, some uh, explanation by some of the authors and writers of the research. I found out that they didn't make mention anything like that. So I need clarification. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, first of all, 
when it comes to liquor scale, it's not always strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. We do have some other scale like excellent, very good, fair, poor, right? Uh, we do have other like very frequent, frequently, uh, very often, uh, often, uh, frequently, sometime, and all those are scale also available. So no one can say you can have only four. You can have four, five, six, seven. That's not matter. This is number one. Number two. You are talking about the specific scale, having a strongly agree, uh, strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, and strongly agree. Okay. I do agree with you that uh, there are some debates, uh, some academicians that argue that no one can be neutral on the statements. No one can be neutral. But uh, those of you who are with me, you would agree with me. When we fill in questionnaire in our life before, before, there were many cases uh, the participants, you have to switch off your microphone, otherwise there yes, will be please. echo. Uh, I think Rita, Sister Rita, can you put off your microphone, please? Unmute yourself, please. Sorry, mute yourself. Okay, thank you. So, I I have personally experienced this. When I try to fill in a questionnaire, I see that I cannot agree. I cannot also disagree. So, what can I do? I click neutral. <laughs> in your life. There are many situations like that. When we make a decision with our wife, sometimes we feel like we cannot agree with the wife. And we cannot disagree with our wife also. So I do what to do. You just keep quiet. <laughs> Am I right? So there are situations in our life where you cannot disagree and you cannot agree. So what can you do? Neutral. Okay? So this is a strong argument that I have for you. But those people saying that there cannot be anything neutral, this is also not wrong uh, with the academic view that when it comes to academic areas, either you have to agree or you have to disagree. You cannot be neutral. So that argument also there. Okay. So uh, uh, personally, I would prefer to have neutral. But if an institution made a rule that neutral should not be there, accept it. There is nothing wrong with that. You can have four. Just take out neutral. What's so big deal? What's so big deal? If I cannot be agree or disagree, I want to be neutral, then I will be forced to choose either disagree or agree. <laughs> it, 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 it is not going to distort your data. It is not going to distort your findings. Not much. Not much. Don't worry. Don't worry. This is a small thing. Just agree with the university rules and regulations. Okay? But definitely, you can go and argue. You just go to see the dean and say, Prof, this is what. I can be neutral in certain cases. Ask him, tell him, do you always agree or disagree with your wife? But sometimes you keep quiet. Then we'll tell you, oh, yeah, true. No, sometimes I keep quiet because I cannot agree, I cannot disagree. So this kind of situation will be always there. So you may have a neutral. Well, you are neutral. You are neutral. You cannot be agree. You cannot be disagree. So the neutral should be there. Okay. So arguments are there in the book. And personally, I'm a very flexible kind of academic. So I would prefer to give the students the freedom to choose, not supervisor university to fix it. All right? Or the supervisor and the student together decide, and they decide whether they want to have neutral or they do not want to have it. All right? I hope I have answered your question, brother. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, Mansur, I can see him coming up, and it's indeed a very wonderful uh, response. Um, ladies and gentlemen, still question time is open. And uh, thank you, Mansur. I can see a long appreciation written. That means you are satisfied with the uh, response. I would love any, to have more questions. I would love to have more questions. More yeah. More questions. Uh, so much any question again, please? Uh, Alaikum. Yes. Alaikum. Yes. Good afternoon. Good evening. We have a question. Okay, let uh, okay. Sister Rita. Is it Rita? Rita. Okay. Yes, okay, Rita. thank you, okay. Professor. Thank you, thank you, everyone. My question is already on the chat box there, but I'm going to read from there again. Professor, thank you for the presentation. It was such an eye-opening um, uh, presentation and package you, you brought to us this evening. Thank you for the privilege of participating in your, and benefiting in your many years of research and expertise. I have this uh, question. You have raised the issue, which is one of the key issues that um, disturb us as um, young researchers. 
the issue of um, pressure for high impact publications and publication in Scopus Index journals has led to scholars contracting academic papers to commercial writers. This invariably has also reduced the quality of research scholars while increasing the quantity of papers. How can this issue be addressed if truly we are looking for quality um, uh, research and quality uh, researchers, uh, research scholars in the academy? Thank you. Mr. Thank you very much. It's a very good, good question. Personally, I, I hate, I personally hate to see where we are now. And now we are focusing on quantity rather than quality. Uh, this is something very sad situation that we are in now. Uh, most of the universities, they, they now compete on the ranking, university ranking. And in terms of university ranking, they want to compete with the numbers, number of items uh, they have in the scopus. And that makes it, uh, uh, that makes it put under pressure. I know some friends, they publish 30, 40, up to 60 papers. Even I have a friend who published 90 papers in a year. I repeat, uh, 90 papers in a year. How did he publish? All his papers published in his corpus index proceedings, not in a journal. So journal, sorry, the conference, they just accept five pages, six pages long papers. It was not gone through the proper review and they publish it and the proceedings is corpus indexed. Can you imagine now? Can a person write 90 papers in a year? Meaning that he was writing one paper in four days. Four days writing one paper. Such a big joke, you know. So I feel so sad looking at that kind of situation that we are in now. Universities are competing in terms of ranking and that forces us to increase the quantity rather than looking at quality. As a good academic, I can write one key one paper in a year or two maybe. If you want to complete a research, it takes you about two years to complete a research, am I right? Your PhD research, how long does it take? Three years. And only after that, you can publish three, four, five, six papers. So how do you expect me to publish two, three, four, Q, one paper every year? How do you expect me to do? So that forces us to go in a situation like, all right, let's look at the quantity first, because I have to save my job. I have to get promoted. I have to get my university well ranked. So we look at the quantity. And when you look at the quantity, we look for journal when, where we can easily penetrate and publish our papers. Okay, so we choose journal which is easily acceptable and easily publishable. And then we are compromising the quality of the papers with quantity. Um, I do not know. Uh, I have been speaking about it in many of my webinars on publishing papers. I hope that the government, ministries, and universities will come back to the sense that it is not about quantity, it is about quality of the research. Hopefully we'll go back to there sometime, you know, sometime we'll get back to sense, inshallah. Uh, Sister Rita, did I answer your question? Absolutely, sir, you did. And I also uh, agree with you for the need that sometime pretty soon, government will look into uh, uh, reversing this trend to quality and not quantity. Sure. Yes, there, there was a brother asking question earlier. Uh, can you oh, yes. now? Yes. Please. Can I ask a question? Please, sure, Nora, sure. go ahead. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alaikum um, Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor. Your lectures have been so impactful and uh, we really enjoy it. You, uh, I've been following you for quite some time now. And uh, I'm a student of a PhD in uh, uh, University of Tara, Malaysia. My question here is, uh, Prof, um, there have been controversies uh, uh, as, as to how I can identify uh, my tool of, tools of analysis. Because um, uh, somebody or one of uh, my supervisors made me to understand that my, my tools of analysis is uh, on the side of the organizational, and the other one is telling me you know, my tools of analysis on the side of the individual. So I'm uh, at the great dilemma now, sir, and I want you to help me out. I'm writing a research on the internal audit effectiveness. So mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how to really go about it. Thank you so much, Prof. Well, uh, this is this is one of the 
a challenge that uh, one of the challenges that uh, any PhD student will face. Uh, look at your research problem, root of the research problem. Does it affect the organization or it affect the individual? If the problem is affecting the organization, then it is an organization level study. So when you choose your theory, theory underpinning theories, then those theories should be organization level theory. If your research problem affect individuals, then you should be choosing individual level theory. So how do I know whether a theory is organization level theory or individual level theory? How do you know? Y yes, sir. Every theory, uh, uh, every theory. Uh, yeah, let me finish, Brother Nora. Okay, I'm trying to answer your question, yes. yes. Yeah, yes. So, so basically, uh, when you look at a theory, every theory is proposed based on certain assumptions, certain assumptions. Look at the assumptions. If all assumptions are individual level assumptions, then the theory is individual individual level theory. If assumptions are organization level assumptions, then the theory is organization level theory. Okay, so that's what you have to look at, huh, brother. If your research problem affects the organization, then you have to choose an organization level theory. So you have to collect data based on organization, and then you have to choose your analysis based on organizations. Did I answer you, brother Nura? Yes, 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 prof. Yes, prof. Yes, prof. So I, I had to now settle the controversies between yeah, the yeah. two supervisors. Okay. No, you have to look at research problem. Uh, the research problem affects the organization or affects the individual. So you are looking at clear, carefully where where the problem is rooted, individual or organization. If it is organization, choose organization level theory. Then you have to tell the supervisor this is basically organization level problem. And I am choosing underpinning theory as organization level theory. And therefore, my analysis should be based on organization, not individual. Uh, did so I make much. it clear, brother? Yeah, 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 yes, yes, bro. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, bro. Hello, Thank you, bro. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is straightforward. Uh, I just want to know how to validate uh, conceptual framework mm. yes, sir. this question is very straight for us but very difficult <laughs> very difficult to answer conceptual framework actually uh when you do qualitative research when you do qualitative research we okay. start with we start from sketch we sketch from zero we don't have any theories in hand so we, we, I'm sorry, are you, are you saying our, something? Before I proceed. Okay. So, so I continue. Huh? So uh, when we have qualitative research, qualitative research, uh, then we don't have a theory. Uh, that's how you proceed to do qualitative research. If you have a theory, you may proceed to quantitative research. You have theoretical framework, your hypothesis and all that. But you don't have a theory. In absence of theory, then you will proceed to qualitative research. When you do qualitative research, then if you start with the research problem, slowly you, you, you look into the problem and you dig into the problem, you explore into, into the detail, then uh, you have some kind of pattern or behavior and all that, and finally you come out with some concept, some concept. Huh? Uh, please look into some of the videos available in my channel, Platform for Research and Development, where you will understand what makes up a theory. In a the theory, there are four building blocks. Theory start with an idea. From idea, it becomes concept. From concept, it becomes construct. From construct, it becomes hypothesis. When hypothesis are proved, it becomes theory. So there are five, five building blocks. So the concept is just second building blocks. After the idea, it becomes concept. So when you do qualitative research, we end up with conceptual framework, just concept. Okay? And if it's a ground-breaking qualitative research, we may end up with a theory. Then you will get a Nobel Prize for that. <laughs> so when you have uh, gone through the qualitative research process at the end of it, you will propose a conceptual framework. The validating should be done by quantitative research. In that case, you have to go for a mixed approach, qualitative followed by quantitative. You have a new qualitative conceptual framework is validated by a quantitative research. Are you following me, brother? Brother Aminu? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Understood, right? Yeah, very well, sir. Very well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, can I ask a question to Professor Isla? Sure, sure. 
I'm here yes, for you. <laughs> yes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, Nadia from Morocco. Uh, I consider you as my uh, second supervisor since I, I attend many uh, lectures uh, presented by uh, Professor Islam. So it's always uh, a pleasure to attend your webinars. Uh, my question is concerning literature review chapter. As a writer, how can I choose a critical approach in order to analyze and discuss the previous study uh, to write the chapter, the literature review chapter? As you said that uh, as a writer, uh, we must have uh, write our voice and uh, uh, leave our own touch in literature review chapter. Well, uh, first of all, we have to understand the difference between. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, first of all, we have to understand the difference between a thesis and a research paper. Okay. Uh, in a thesis, you have very long, uh, long chapter, Baba. Uh, you have to give me a few seconds. My son, baby son, is here. Uh, just give me one, one minute. Possibly just one minute. Huh? <laughs> yes, professor. Just give me one minute break. Short break. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, while Prof takes one minute break, I would want to use this opportunity to announce to you that the main conference, you know, this lecture is our pre-conference workshop. The main conference is coming up tomorrow, uh, inshallah, uh, by eight, between 8 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Malaysian time. And uh, by the special grace of God, we are going to post the link, uh, which you will use to join at the opening ceremony of the conference tomorrow. Yeah. He's back. Thank you. All right. So, so let me answer the, the question posed by the sister. Okay. Uh, so I was saying that literature review writing in the thesis and paper is different. Uh, in the thesis, uh, if, if we have the longest chapter is the uh, literature review, right? The longest chapter. Uh, if you compare to chapter one, three, four, five, literature review with a longer chapter. Um, even the paper is a very concise one. In both cases, uh, most of the time what you see that the student has a likeliness of taking things and just putting it down. You take, you take from one author, followed by another author, followed by another author, and you just continue uh, presenting the chronological order. That's what I said earlier. That is the easiest way of writing literature review. But a good writer, good author, should be always making a stand. Because when you review a paper, you find one researcher found negative effect, another researcher found positive effect, another researcher found no effect. So you have many different findings on the same uh, topic, okay? So that's where you have to have your own, you have to debate, you have to say, uh, David found out this, then William found out this, Amin found out this, and finally your stand. What is your stand? You have to make your own perspective based on the context of research. Remember, your premise of research is different. Somebody who has found to be positive, his country is a developed country. Somebody found to be negative is a developing country. And your country is a developed country. It's your underdeveloped country. So you have to make that premise, difference of premise and context. And you have to make your point stronger there. Based on your country, your context, your premise, you have to make your stand. Okay? Because the findings in Australia or UK, May not be same as my country, right? Because my country culture, the religion, the values are totally different from them. So that's why you have to make it. That's what I said. You have to make a standpoint and you have to make it very clear of what you mean by this. Okay. Say, for example, when you are reviewing literature on the same topic, after going through 40, 50 papers, you may have identified 15 independent variables. But in your framework, how many are you going to take? Maximum five. Why did you choose these five, not other 10? You are making a stand. You are making a stand. So you have to have an argument. Why did you choose this five? Why not the other ten? So in every case, you have to have your own uh, inferences there, and huh? that makes you a critical review. Okay, sister. Thank you so okay. much, Professor Islam. God bless you. 
Amen. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Kessie Nadia. And ladies and gentlemen, due to time factor. Can I ask a question? I think we allow another few questions. Uh, it's okay, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, you said I'm at the time. Uh, Webex. Uh, I'm Ibrahim Berlo Osman. I'm uh, a student at uh, University of Florida, Malaysia. So, okay. I, so this and I tried to join. Uh, uh, it's been quite interesting. Um, uh, it's been good attending this and this is my first time having such thing with uh, other institutions. So I quite appreciate it. Uh, but I want to just uh, ask a question on uh, the narration, narrating your story in uh, writing. This is just what I want to do, and I want to ask in relation to my own work so that I understand it better. Uh, uh, I am particularly working on uh, environmental economics. I'm trying to look at preferences of pastoralists, preferences of pastoralists in uh, uh, grazing management. So we develop attributes, design from a software, you take the attribute to another software. So I use SaaS, I'm uh, using NLogic to do the processing. So trying to maintain the story now, I'm back to what I was I really want to ask. Uh, many people have different ways of handling this. In most cases, you see that the report uh, may be uh, basic conditional uh, logic. That is the uh, first aspects. Others do mixed logic or Latin class models and so on and so forth. So, but I am just trying to focus on preferences because. Uh, one of the issues I've realized is that uh, we try to have crazy reserves, we try to control, uh, it's a major problem actually in Nigeria. Now, grazing is a big problem. In northern, southern Nigeria is an issue. So we are trying to see people settle in grazing reserves. And even in those uh, uh, particular northern aspects, the area where we have uh, can you please go straight to the question please okay yeah well okay i've been saying so much problems let me let me go back again to what is your question yeah well, what okay is your question? now in looking at preference i want to understand if i am uh uh taking it uh maybe conditional logic that is looking at the uh, standard deviations are mostly what is reported and so on then willing willingness to pay from these people because it's economic valuation that is used to determine the values of those attributes and then uh, interaction of with social demography so if i do this on conditional logic maybe use as objective one mixed logic uh random utility modeling for objective two and the uh, latin class model trying to all discuss these uh, uh standard deviations willingness to pay and interaction is it okay to just use this yeah, i understood i understood your question basically you are talking you are your studies on economics so you will be using econometrics modeling so yeah, basic exactly. modeling, you can have different uh, few formulas, few equations together, no problem. You can have model one, model two, model three, model four, model five, no problem at all. So a different situation, different research question is being plotted in a different uh, model. So model one, uh, uh, answer the research question one. Model two, answer the research question two, no problem. Even you can have model one combining research question one and two and model two answering the research question three, no problem at all. So you can have, Three, four model answering three, four research question. And at the end, you can have an integrated model answering all research questions. That also can be done. So you check your hypothesis one by one in one model, and then you combine it and test it as a combined model. No problem. That can be done. 
Did I did I answer your question? Yes, sir. But I'm also trying to know having those three things being looked at in every objective, whether it is okay under conditional logic to have uh, the basic variable. That's why I said that's why I said we have different models. So different model okay. you have different condition being added. Okay. You extend okay. model one by one. You have one equation, then followed by another equation, followed by another equation. So you add yeah. on, add on, add on, you know. So that's yeah. how it is. Yeah. Okay. One of my PhD student did a, a finance study on stochastic modeling. And uh, she has about 101 equations. Finally, she arrived at a conclusion. So there's no problem on that. So you can start with the first initial model. And based on that model, you can continue developing more models and you test. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Okay. 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 Did, I, did, I, did my answer help you? Yes, sir. I have an idea of it. Okay. 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 Thank you so much for uh, your Prof. question and thank you. Prof. I have a question. Yes, sir. Please continue. Yes. Uh, maybe we just take another please. Two, another one question. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Continue, please. Hello, Prof. Good afternoon. Continue. Good afternoon. Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Prof, I would like if you can throw more light on firm level data. Firm level data. This is in connection with my study, trying to look at FDI, institutional quality. I wanted to look at it from panel point of view, mm -hmm. but my supervisor is trying to, uh, let me shift the focus to only specific country and look at it from one particular country. But in this case, look at it from firm level data. So I'm mm -hmm. a bit confused for the past three weeks. I've been trying to get the concept. So I think it will be best opportunity if you can share your idea with me as to the specific thing that you want me to do. Thank you very much. Okay. First of all, uh, I have I I have never done any research using Kano model. Uh, um, I have heard of it. I'm not even very familiar with the model, so it'd be difficult for me to guide you if you are using Kano model. <laughs> okay. Uh, when it come to farm level okay, data, we thank know. you very much. Yeah, we, we, we know actually what uh, what are the, the data we, uh, we, we we consider them at farm level data, and then you can use that. But uh, since you are in the Kano model, I'm very sorry, brother. I, I cannot really uh, answer your question since I'm not familiar with the model. <laughs> I have to be very honest, okay? Thank you. I okay, think the thank last you very much. Yeah, maybe one last question. Uh, the uh, we have some questions in the chat box. I see. Okay, raise it now, yeah. please. Uh, faster, yes. President, can you read it out? Is the president there? Yes, the president is there. Um, those in the control room, uh, can you can one of you read the question, please? Those in the control room. Okay, uh, there's one question I see just now uh, saying that uh, the student wants to do uh, doing a qualitative research and supervisor wants him to include theories. <laughs> okay. Uh, if theory is available, then you should be developing a theoretical framework and then continue doing uh, quantitative research. Uh, if you are doing a qualitative research, uh, we do qualitative research in the absence of theories, okay? So I'm not sure how are you going to deduce theories while you are doing quali qualitative research. But there are certain grounded theory approach. Huh? There are some theories, are, and the student says otherwise we'll fail. <laughs> uh, there are certain theories, we call them grounded theory. Uh, these theories are data-driven theories, okay? So if you look at, the classifications of theories or types of theories. Uh, there are many different kinds of theories are there. Uh, some theories are known as middle level theory, uh, grand theories, macro theories, and also one of the category of theory, we call it grounded, grounded theories. So grounded theories are theories actually that, that, that are not really very established, okay? And uh, these theories have been proposed based on the data. So you just collect the data and you run the data, you come out with some kind of theories, and that's what we call data driven through the grounded theories. So, in qualitative research, yes, you can introduce those kind of theories, no problem in that. So, you have to find some grounded theories on the 
relevant area that you are conducting research. Then you can cite them. Uh, that these theories are basically helping you to develop the conceptual framework of your peer study. Okay, not the ground, not the ground granny theory, not the macro theory, not uh, the shared theory, um, not borrowed theory. Those theories cannot be used in qualitative research. In qualitative research, you can only use grounded theories. So find it out and import them. Should be all right, no problem. Any other question from the chat box, uh, Mr. Yes, President? those in the control room. Ilyasu, can you read the question? Yes, uh, there's one question which said, uh, kindly discuss the basic difference, if any, between a review paper and a concept not meant for publication. Please uh, kindly state any two examples of topic that can serve as concept, not topic for publication in a journal. Yeah, basically you are coming out with a completely new idea uh, with, uh, with, with the absence of substantial citations and uh, uh, industrial evidences. Uh, those paper definitely you cannot publish. If you want to publish in a journal, they want citations, okay? So if you have completely new idea and you've got no citation about it, uh, there's going to be a concept paper. Uh, those paper can be published in the newspaper, in the magazines, not in the journal, okay? And the review papers are basically when you are reviewing number of um, papers. And there are many different kinds of there, you know, meta-analysis and many other different methods also there uh, to write review papers, okay? So you have to follow the protocols of what kind of paper you are writing. But if you are writing concept paper that is not for publishing purposes, it's because the idea is completely fresh and new and you don't have any support from literature. So you can publish in the newspaper and magazines, uh, not in a established uh, journal. I hope I answered the question. Okay. Uh, Next. Another question? Okay. Yes, yes, please. Uh, Prof, recently I sent my paper to Web of Science Journal. However, I got five rejections at the editor decks. What is uh, your advice for me to improve my paper? <laughs> okay, uh, first of all, uh, when uh, the, there are a few stages of review process, the first stage is rejection by the editor. Uh, editor doesn't feel that your paper fall in the scope of the journal. Okay, uh, so this is one. The second one is is fall in the scope of the journal, but it does not mean minimum requirement to be sent for further review. So when you send back the paper, he will give you certain comments. Look at the comments, and if you feel that those comments can be addressed like one of my PhD students huh? last month, the month before he submitted to a journal, Q3 journal, and the editor rejected the paper, sent back to him with some comments. So when you look at the comments, he feel that it can be addressed. So what he did, he just did all this correction and submitted the paper in the same journal. Now they have accepted from the first stage. Now he is sending to the reviewers, okay? So if your journal paper is rejected, uh, look at the comments given by the editor. If he outrightly rejects saying that it is not in the scope of the journal, for, like, for example, my one of my paper, I was the co-author was rejected last month. Uh, the editor says it doesn't fall in the scope of the journal, so rejected. So we know why it is rejected. So you have to find the appropriate journal uh, that that is within the scope of our paper. Then we publish them. Okay. Any other question from the chat box? Uh, yes. So, so, Doctor, how many minimum references are needed for a review paper? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> for a PhD thesis, uh, for PhD, we expect minimum 200 citations. Uh, for masters, we expect minimum 100 citations. If you are writing a research paper, we expect at least 20, at least 20. Huh? It depends on the kind of research problem you have. But we prefer to have at least 20. Being an editor, huh? I, 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 I am also a member of number of editorial boards of journals. I was a chief editor of also a journal before, so chief editor now on one of the journal. So we look at at least, at least 20, at least 20 uh, citations should be there in the paper. Doctor? Yes. Yeah, I got a question. Uh, I'm yes. Shiva Mohan. I'm uh, doing my PhD in UM. So I came across, actually I'm doing a uh, study on blockchain so it's a quite new field uh, i read some of the review papers some of the information are repetitive that means uh, from one particular journal there is one uh, information 
and the same information repeated from a paper from a different journal. So when I cite or when I quote, it's like repeating same information from two different journals. I'm quite confused on this issue. Can you please explain how do I overcome? Thank you. <laughs> Siva. Um, uh, I do now focus on uh, blockchain. Uh, uh, one of my postdoctoral students just completed a research on blockchain, and I have another postdoctoral student also doing research on blockchain. I'm writing a book now on blockchain. Uh, hopefully, it uh, will be published in uh, three, four months' time. How blockchain can be used to run university effectively. That's the title of uh, the book that I'm writing now. Okay. How university can use the blockchain to run the university. <laughs> um, uh, what you have said is very true when I'm reviewing papers on blockchain now because it is a completely new area. Uh, so not many people actually have written on it. Uh, so those who have written, we are just copying each other. That's what is going on now. So uh, so when you are citing them, uh, cite just one. If same concept we talked about by many, cite only one person. I think that's better to be safe. But again, if you do that, then you are going to have lack of citation. And the number of citations are going to be less. So, so in, in that case, possibly uh, you can uh, cite two, but from different contexts. Okay, same issue, but different contexts. Then you can cite two authors or three authors. And I think that might help you to solve this problem. Uh, okay. Does this help, Mr. Siva? Yeah, yeah. I'm doing on a government perspective, doctor. Okay. So when you are writing literature, possibly if you find the same issue being addressed by a few, so... You get evidence from government sector, also get from a, a, a private sector. So then same thing, you can cite too, no problem on that. Okay. The right. context of premise of research is different. Yes, okay. yes. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Welcome. A question? Yeah, I think that we go for the last question. <laughs> Only 11, uh, 23. Uh, and tomorrow I have a day-long workshop to be conducted. Whole day workshop, eight hours. I'm going to talk eight hours on the research Can method. Can I ask again. one question now? Yes. The last question, yes. Thank you very much, Bro, for this. Uh, Can you be louder? Can you be louder, please? Okay. I want to, first of all, thank you for this uh, insightful presentation. Personally, I've been able to grab one or two things from your presentation. And then my first question is, uh, Prof, for example, if I send a paper to three different journals, and at the end of the day, I'm able to get an acceptance from one of the journals, now do I still need to write to the two other journals to withdraw my paper, even if I'm yet to get uh, a reply whether the paper is accepted or not from the journal. Do I still need to write to withdraw the paper from the two other journals when I've, I've already gotten a, an acceptance from one of the journals? Okay, first of all, um, all good journals, when you submit paper, they will ask you to answer the question, was, is this paper submitted to another journal? <laughs> uh, by right, we should not be submitting paper in three different journals at the same time. You should be submitting to one journal only. Look at the scope of the journal, identify the right journal that you would like to publish, publish, submit in one journal. And then if the XAP is fine, if they reject, then only you should submit in another journal. Okay. Now, uh, in case um, the journal did not ask you that question, is this paper submitted to another journal? So in that case, maybe you can submit in two journals, but once, as soon as one journal tells you that they're accepting your paper, immediately you should withdraw your paper from another journal. Okay. If not, what would happen, you know, uh, I tell you uh, an example what happened to me. Uh, one of my paper was copied by someone from Oman. From Oman, huh? Oman. So uh, he copied my paper exactly, title, everything the same. He just changed the name and published. And I didn't know. Then suddenly I got an email from UITM, Shalom, eh, Malaysia, the UITM. The lecturer had got my paper, also that paper, and emailed to me and asked me which is which. <laughs> and when I saw it, I was so shocked, you know. So I say, what can I do now? How can that happen? Because I know this is my paper. I did not copy. So I look at the publication date. Okay, so the, the, the guy who copied my paper, 
he copied me and published six months after my publication. So then I replied to the email. I told uh, that uh, academic staff, please look at the data publication. So mine is original. I published first, and then he copied and published. So I did not stop there. I wrote an email to him, the person who plagiarized my paper, giving CC to his dean and his vice chancellor, and I asked him to withdraw and apologize. And he did that. You know, uh, so this is very common. So in your paper, if you publish in one journal and then you publish in another journal, that's the kind of situation I'm going to have. The both journal may may forbid you to publish any paper in the future in their journals. And if it's in Scopus Index Journal, they may even Scopus may give you punishment of not being allowed to publish for five years in the Scopus Index Journals. So be careful. Okay, sister. Yeah, thank you. Clarification. Clear, right? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. So I think uh, I, I tried to handle uh, the questions uh, being raised. Uh, I think there were some very uh, good questions uh, that clarify many uh, uh, issues. Uh, affecting the academics, uh, especially new authors. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, thank you again, the organizers, for inviting me. And uh, I have tried my best to make it in a way like everybody can be benefited. I'm not sure how much uh, beneficial it was, how much useful it was. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, uh, keep me in your prayers. And uh, I do have my YouTube channel. You can always be there. and. Uh, I do have actually WhatsApp groups. Uh, I have four groups of 1,000 people there from worldwide. Uh, that's why you can join to see uh, the updates. Uh, almost every month I have some webinars. Uh, uh, so if you want to participate, you can you can join, okay? So thank you again and uh, may God bless you and you all uh, stay safe. I, I, I have been reading that the third wave is coming. I think South Africa is already there and there's some other countries getting affected. Uh, so please stay safe and stay healthy and uh, hope to see you some other occasions. And I wish the international conference organized by you is starting tomorrow going to be a grand success, inshallah. So I pass it back to the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we are still having in the WebEx more than 100. You can imagine this is to show that the presentation is engaging. The last time I saw was 160 something. So still above 100, apart from the Facebook that have joined us, uh, you know, outside the WebEx. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are President ATM and his own team, the control room. We want to most sincerely thank you so much. As the president announced, this is just pre-conference. If this is beautiful, then imagine what could happen tomorrow for the, in the opening ceremony. Be with us tomorrow so that you enjoy all the goodies from the guest speakers that will be invited. Uh, Prof, thank you so much for everything. And may I re-invite our president for a word of thanks and the closing prayer. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, the Last half ceremony of today's program as Abdul Mumini in that. I at this point want to appreciate and thank uh, Professor Dr. D. Aminul Islam for presenting a hands on and practicable um, guide on how to draft a scientific paper and present in high impact journal. Prof, you have really proved that what we have even read about you, you are even more than what we have seen. Uh, I was fortunate to go through the research gate, uh, to go through your profile on research gate, and I saw the number of citations that your publication attracted. But uh, as a young researcher, I just bow. So seeing what you presented today, in fact, that has even uh, gone to the extent of saying that um, you are even more of what you have been presented uh, in what we read. Prof, we cannot thank you enough. We thank you so much. We thank you very sincerely. For despite your, your tight schedules, you still squeeze time to be with us on the invitation of ISS Nigeria and UTM International that we always uh, collaborate in organizing programs. 
Uh, Prof, on behalf of the executive of ISS Nigeria and the members of ISS Nigeria, I, the president, want to most sincerely thank and appreciate you for finding time to be with us today to deliver this pre-conference lecture. Um, from some of the discussions I've been having with my colleagues that they've benefited a lot from Prof's uh, lecture, I want to say to Prof that hopefully, by the special grace of God, hopefully, hopefully, we will find a time with you to Nigeria to have a face-to-face -face chat with some of our traditional uh, leaders because we are organizing we are organizing a traditional chieftaincy title to Prof, inshallah, <laughs> from Nigeria. So, Prof, I want to appreciate you and thank you for all that you are doing for humanity and pray to Almighty God to continue to bless and reward you abundantly. Um, lastly, I want to appreciate the leadership of, of UTM uh, under the full leadership of uh, Professor Dr. Ahmad Fauzi Ismail, the Vice Chancellor of the University, and the leadership of UTM International, whom uh, collaboratively provided the platform for us to reach out to all our audience today. We thank them for giving us this opportunity uh, to present this program. Uh, please keep a date with us tomorrow uh, by 8 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Malaysian time, which is GMT plus 8, for the opening ceremony of ESS 2021 conference. The conference promised to be very robust and very, uh, very colorful as well. The uh, guest speaker and the uh, keynote speakers are already ready for tomorrow's program. So once again, Prof and the participants, we thank you all for giving us this opportunity uh, to present this program to you. And I uh, want to wish each and every one of you uh, a safe uh, journey back home, even though it is through online program. Uh, but then uh, we thank you all for sparing time to be with us. Thank you and assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you. Will, will you allow me to leave now? <laughs> All right. So if you allow me, then. We to recognize the presence of uh, Dr. Dodo, Dr. Aminu Dodo uh, from Turkey. So finally, I think uh, the group photo is important with Prof, inshallah. <laughs> so uh, the control room should organize that. You should have taken earlier when you have many participants. <laughs> yeah. Even now it's... No, this is just to sample. We had over 200 participants. Uh, yeah. and, and I, and take it now, yeah, please. Uh, those of you can switch on your ca camera, please switch on the camera. So switch switch on your cameras. Switch on your cameras, please. Yeah, there are many pages, so you have to be patient. It will take some time. <laughs> so one page can only show about 20, so it's still, I think, about four pages. So it will take some time. I need it. I, 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 I didn't want to okay. I count After the count of three, I'll take one photo and repeat okay. another for a freestyle. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So after the count of three, put a smile on your face. One, two, three. Smiles. Okay. Second, I'll now count one, two, three. We take a freestyle. Any style you feel like doing. <laughs> put a smile. One, okay. two, and three. One, two, and three. Thank you, folks. Thank you.